Well, I have the privilege, uh, brothers and sisters, of ministering God's Word uh, tonight uh, as our pastor is away, as you know, in Atlanta. And so open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21 is our passage for tonight. And I want to begin by reading this passage from the ESV version. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And always remember that when we open up God's Word and we read God's Word, this is God's authoritative, inerrant, infallible, sufficient Word. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, wrote a fictional poem called A Vision of the Lost. It's three to four minutes long, but I think it's worth you listening to this. I saw a dark and stormy ocean. Over it, the black clouds hung heavily. Through them, every now and then, vivid lightning flashed and loud thunder rolled, while the winds moaned and the waves rose and foamed, towered and broke, only to rise and foam, tower and break again. And in that ocean, I saw myriads of poor human beings, plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning, And as they cursed and screamed, they rose and shrieked again, and then some sank to rise no more. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean a mighty rock that rose up with its summit towering high above the black clouds that overhung the stormy sea. And all around the base of this great rock, I saw a vast platform. Onto this platform, I saw with delight a number of the poor, struggling, drowning wretches continually climbing up out of the angry ocean. And I saw that a few of those who were already safe on the platform were helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach safety. And as I looked closer, I found a number of those who had been rescued, industriously working and scheming by ladders, ropes, boats, and other means more effective to deliver the poor strugglers out of the sea. Here and there were some who actually jumped into the water, regardless of the consequences and their desire to rescue the perishing. And I hardly know which gladdened me the most. The sight of the poor drowning people climbing onto the rocks reaching a place of safety or the devotion and self-sacrifice of those whose whole person was wrapped up in the effort for their deliverance. As I looked on, I saw that the occupants of that platform were quite a mixed company. That is, they were divided into different sets or classes, and they occupied themselves with different pleasures and employments. But only a very few of them seemed to make it their business to get the people out of the sea. And what puzzled me most was the fact that though all of them had been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten this. Strangely, it seemed that the memory of its darkness and danger no longer troubled them at all. And what seemed equally strange and perplexing to me was that these people did not even seem to have any care, that is, any agonizing care about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their very eyes, many of whom were their own husbands and wives brothers and sisters, and even their own children. Now this astonishing unconcern was not the result of ignorance or or lack of knowledge because they lived right in the midst of it all. They even talked about it sometimes. Many even went regularly to hear lectures and sermons in which the awful state of these poor drowning creatures was talked about. And yet the occupants of this platform were engaged in different pursuits and pastimes, Some of them were absorbed day and night in trading and business in order to make gain, storing up their savings in boxes and safes and the like. Many spent their time in amusing themselves with growing flowers on the side of the rock, others in painting pieces of cloth or in playing music or in dressing themselves up in different styles and walking about to be admired. 
Some occupied themselves chiefly in eating and drinking. Others were taken up with arguing about the poor drowning creatures that had already been rescued. But the thing to me that seemed the most amazing was that those on the platform to whom the Master called with a capital M, who heard his voice and felt that they ought to obey it, at least they said they did, those who confessed to love him much and were in full sympathy with him in the task he had undertaken, who worshipped him or who professed to do so, these were so taken up with their trades and professions, their money-saving and pleasures, their families and circles, their religions and arguments about it, and their preparation for going to the mainland, that they did not listen to the cry that came to them from this wonderful being who had himself gone down into the sea. If they heard it, they did not heed it. They did not seem to care. And so the multitude went on right before them, struggling and shrieking and drowning in the darkness. This is, of course, brethren, a fictional piece. But what a sobering and accurate picture of what I would also say is the state of our city, is the state of our county, is the state of our state, is the state of our country, is the state of our world, right? But even more sobering is the point the author is making here about the the sort of casual attitude that many professing Christians have toward the lost in our world, perhaps some of us even in this room. It may be that some of us have forgotten, at least as the story, those in the story did, of the fact that we too were once not safe, that at one time we too were wicked and helpless and without God in the world. And others of us perhaps have become so preoccupied with with earthly, worldly things, the toys of life, if you will, the accumulation of wealth and of possessions and of position, even placing our hope on politics and political movements. We can become fixated on all of these trivial things, beloved, and how easy it is for us to forget why we're here as Christians. That the world needs, that what the world needs most is heart revival, not cultural revolution. That what the world needs most is heart reformation and transformation, not social deconstruction. This is what the world needs. And if there was ever a man who understood all of this from personal experience, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul understood the the spiritual plight and darkness and spiritual decadence of humanity because he was lost and hopeless at one point before Jesus as well. But then one glorious day, God moved in the heart of Paul and Paul had a collision with Christ and he was never the same. He was forever changed. And from that time on, from the time of his conversion and his collision with Jesus, Paul lived for one singular purpose, and that was to devote himself to the ministry of reconciliation, of calling sinners to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he had been transformed himself. And in fact, it's this ministry of reconciliation that is the central focus of the passage that we just read. Five times in this passage, that word reconcile appears in various forms, twice in verse 18, twice in verse 19, and once in verse 20. It's the central focus of the text. And as Paul defends his apostleship, he focuses the attention of these divisive Corinthians on what matters most, on what should be their their central occupation in the world. And and that's the often neglected ministry of reconciliation. And so, brothers and sisters, I want us to spend some time tonight considering this crucial ministry that we've been given as Christians. And for you to ask yourself this, am I truly committed to this chief central occupation, that of making disciples? Or have I grown cold 
Have I grown callous, somewhat indifferent to lost rebel sinners all around me? Now listen, I'm not here to guilt trip you tonight, all right? I'm not here to guilt trip you tonight to be more evangelistic. I'm not here to give you some, some pep talk where you are somehow emotionally uh, uh, moved and for a time you go out and you share Christ with other people but eventually it's, it's short-lived and it wasn't sincere and genuine and you don't continue to share your faith with other people. I'm not here to do that. Rather, my prayer and my desire, the desire of my heart is that the Spirit of God with a capital S would move in your heart through His Word so that you would be awakened in your affections all the more for the lost around us and catapulted out of a heart of, of recognition that there are broken people before us all in our society, that you would be catapulted all the more by sincere motivation for, of love for broken sinners to share Christ with them. That's what we need in this day and age. That's why we're here. And so where are we to begin if we're going to be committed to this often neglected ministry of reconciliation? I think first and foremost, we need to begin here. We need to begin by exulting in the beauty of reconciliation. Notice I said exulting, not exalting, but exulting in the beauty of reconciliation. And we begin here because frankly, some of us have lost that sense of exultation. That sense of joy and rejoicing and relishing and appreciation and of marveling and adoring the God of the universe because of the reconciliation that he has accomplished in our lives. I think we've lost that sense of enjoyment and of worship and adoration at what God has done in us through Jesus Christ. Consequently, we're not motivated to share Jesus with anyone. The old saying may be true of you tonight, familiarity, familiarity has bred contempt in your heart. I liken this to, to marriage, where if not careful, over time the, the sweetness of marriage can fade away, right? Now that you've won that person, now that you've procured their, their hand in marriage, and time has passed by, you no longer cherish and treasure that person as at the beginning. That can happen in the Christian life as well. Maybe at first your salvation was sweet and glorious, but now that you've been walking with the Lord for some time, now all of a sudden you've lost that sense of awe and, and wonder and marveling at the great salvation of God. And so this is why we often need to revisit the foot of the cross, beloved, and be reminded of the glories of the gospel, right? Paul does that here. This is one of my favorite passages and verses, verse 17 in all of the Bible. Look at verse 17. He says, Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, and you know that terminology, if anyone is in Christ in union with Jesus, in an abiding relationship with Jesus, in other words, if you've turned from your sins and put your faith in Jesus, you are a believer, you are a follower of Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. I want you to savor this and think and ponder this for a minute. That old you no longer exists in the gospel because of reconciliation. God has performed a tremendous change in your life. The moment you came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, you have a new orientation, a new purpose, new desires to obey to him out of a heart of love and gratitude for all that he's done. You are a new creature. How often do you relish in this? How often do you exult in this? Do you remember the old you? Do you remember that, what it was like to live and worship the great idol of self, brothers and sisters? Do you remember what it was like to, to trust in your moralism? To trust in your self-righteousness apart from Jesus? So that you didn't call upon the name of the Lord because you, you didn't need him. After all, you saw yourself as righteous and morally upright. Do you remember how you used to use other people and exploit them to get what you wanted? Do you remember the old you? I often ponder the, the old campus, not to be paralyzed by my past, but to relish again and again the goodness of God in my life. You know, I grew up in, a, in an abusive home with a stepfather who used to beat my mother to a pulp, oftentimes leaving her half dead on the floor. Eventually, that culminated in him shooting her in front of me. Boy, brethren, let me tell you this. I hated God. 
I hated God. The thought of a loving God who had allowed such a thing was not a positive one for me. I was bitter and resentful toward him, and I would tell, I would tell him about it. On my way to school, I would often shake my fist at the sky, literally this little boy saying, I hate you, God, in Spanish, and cussing him with the worst kinds of cuss words in Spanish. I hated God. And then one day, God moved in my heart later on in life at the age of 17, and I had a collision with Jesus, and I came to realize that I wasn't just some victim, but that I was an exploiter of other people. That I was a mutinous sinner, a rebel sinner, a God hater. I was not better than anyone else, but in my heart I was guilty of the same sins that I pointed my finger at other people for, for committing. I realized that I was no better. And isn't that true of all of us? Amen? Or am I the only sinner in here? This is true for all of us. None of us are better. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one stands on higher ground. We all come in the same way. We're all sinners saved by grace. Amen? Amen. All of us are. We all need to be reconciled to God. But, But then herein lies the great wonder of the gospel, brothers and sisters, that even though we've offended a holy and just God, even though we haven't fleshed out our purpose of glorifying him and enjoying him, even though we have rebelled against God and deserve hell and condemnation, it wasn't us, it wasn't you, Christian, who initiated making things right with God. God stepped in and made the first step, didn't he? God did this. I don't want you to miss this. Look at verse 18. All this, all of this work of of newness as it pertains to our reconciliation, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Oh, just pause and relish that for a minute. I mean, isn't it true that that in normal human relationships, what what is expected, what is natural, what is reasonable is that when two sides are in conflict with one another, it's the side who offended the other who should initiate making things right. Yes? Somebody offends you, legitimately hurts you, it's more than reasonable, it's more than expected that that person who offended you should initiate reconciliation with God, not the other way around. But did you notice the grammar there in verse 18? Look there. It says that this reconciliation is, say it with me, from God. That is, God is the source. God is the originator of this. God is the divine initiator. It's God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Wow. Wow. And it would be one thing if we would have been lovable and attractive people before Jesus Christ, but we were the exact opposite. I know I was. This is why we love verses like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, right? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, underline that, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And if in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even in that place of filthiness where we weren't running towards God, but we were running away from God. Boy, that puts our reconciliation in perspective, doesn't it? We tend to love people who are lovable, who are attractive, who reciprocate our love and kindness. Those are the people that we tend to love. But in the case of God, our Savior, he initiated reconciliation toward people who are unworthy, messy sinners who are rebels against him. Boy, that's glorious. We should exult in that great reality, brothers and sisters. We should exult in the fact that now as new creatures, we've gone from wicked to holiness. From being condemned to being justified sinners saved by grace. From being enemies of God to friends of God and children of God and holy and beloved of God. That we have gone from spiritual death to now spiritual life. Amen? I hope that you exult in that. Even this Christmas season. We should do this every single day. But the holidays especially provide us with an opportunity to be reminded of God's favor upon us. 
through the cherished and treasured Jesus. Exult in your wonderful reconciliation. This is where faithfulness to our ministry of reconciliation begins. We need to exult in the beauty of our reconciliation, but don't stop there. Second, let that drive you then to engage as a bearer of reconciliation. Engage as a bearer or as an agent, as an instrument of reconciliation. See, having contemplated our reconciliation, our passionate desire should should be to see other sinners now made right with God. Like the Apostle Paul. Yes, an apostle, but a sinner saved by grace just like us. That man, after he was converted, was all in as a bearer of the message of the gospel. He was all in for the gospel. Just listen to his diehard commitment to the gospel. Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of this powerful gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 23, listen to this. I do it all, he says, for the sake of the gospel. There's not anything that I wouldn't do for the sake of Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me, says Paul, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, he says this, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You think this man was all in for the sake of Christ? Absolutely. I'm under deep compulsion. I can't help it, says Paul. I can't do anything else but to preach Christ. Brethren, that should be our hearts as well. By the power of the Spirit of God. Now let's put some meat to this. If you're going to engage as a bearer of reconciliation, here are two areas of your life that you need to cultivate, okay? And these are sort of subpoints under that second main point. First of all, if you're going to be a bearer of reconciliation and engage in this task that God has given you, you must cultivate a sense of responsibility. In other words, a sense of ownership of this ministry. Because you see, as Christians, we are under divine orders to engage in this ministry of reconciliation. Look at this in verse 18. All this, he says, is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And here it is. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, Christian, not only did God lovingly uh, reconcile you to himself through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also graciously gifted you with a ministry, and that is the ministry of reconciliation. And then I love the, the different words that he uses here to emphasize our responsibility to fulfill this central ministry. Notice at the end of verse 18, he calls it the, the ministry of reconciliation, doesn't he? Ministry, diakonos, from which we get our word deacon, which means servant. Did you know that as Christians we are servants of the ministry of reconciliation? There might be many ministries that you're a part of. You're ministering in different capacities, serving in different capacities to one extent or another. But are you being faithful to your primary chief service ministry, and that is calling sinners to be reconciled to God? You ask, where should I do this, Pastor Kempis? In all of your various mission fields, in your home life, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your schools, wherever the Lord has you, those are your divine appointments. Oftentimes we pray, God, send me some divine appointments. Send me some people that I can share Christ with. Just look at your many mission fields, your home life, your neighborhood. Do you even know your neighbors? Do you know people in your school, your workplace? Those are the divine appointments God has already given you. We are responsible in those many mission fields to cultivate relationships for the sake of the, of the gospel. Notice also, not only are we servants, but we're also stewards of the ministry of reconciliation. Where do you get that, Pastor Campus? Look at the end of verse 19. It says that we have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation, right? End of verse 19, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Brethren, that's language of stewardship, of the fact that God has deposited in us a precious message and we're going to be held accountable someday future for how we carried out our stewardship. 
And then not only are we servants and stewards, but also spokesmen or heralds of the ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 20. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. In ancient times, ambassadors were, were heralds, spokesmen who represented the monarch, the conquering king or general, and they spoke on behalf of the coming ruler. And ambassadors came with the fullness of authority of the king, not just with a message, but with a warning as well. They came not just with the terms of the king, but also with what's going to happen if you don't submit to the king and bow down to the coming emperor or ruler. What a sobering thing. Bring it over to the ministry that we carry out. Brethren, this is our responsibility as well as it pertains to the gospel. Not only do we call sinners to repentance, but we, we caution them. We also warn them with graciousness and gentleness of what's to happen if they don't submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about the kind of heart that we should come with in a minute. But suffice it to say, sharing the hope of Christ is the, the primary reason, Christian, why you're here. Do you recognize that? This is why we're here, brothers and sisters. We could worship more. As somebody has said, everything else that we do here in this, on this earth, we could do better in heaven more perfectly. We could worship God more unhindered in heaven, no more sin. We could fellowship more sweetly together in heaven. We could sing perfectly uh, sincere and genuine in heaven. We can be perfect in our holiness in heaven. We're here on earth as agents of reconciliation, and it's so important for us to be reminded of this tonight, like an ice-cold bucket of water for our heads. We need a reminder, some of us, of why we're here, because we've lost a sense of purpose. We've lost a sense of focus. Because it's easy these days as we observe the chaos and corruption around us to become outraged to become angry, to become frustrated with all that's happening around us. How many of you are angry or frustrated or in some way outraged by all that's happening around us right now? Be honest. Come on now. If you're not, something's wrong with you. <laughs> because the fact is, it is outrageous. It is upsetting, isn't it? There is a lot of evil that we're seeing in our country and all over the world. It is difficult. Let's be real about the hideousness of what we're seeing all around us and observing, even here in our county. But listen to me. On the other hand, brothers and sisters, may we never forget this. May we never forget that were it not for the grace and the mercy and the goodness and the love of God, you and I would be in exactly the same place. We would still be there as well. How often do you ponder that? Hear me, such were some of us. Such were some of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, right? We were the sexually immoral. We were the idolaters. We were the immoral. We were the adulterers, even if in our hearts. We were the haters of God and the haters of other people. We were the bitter and the resentful and the thieves. We were the moralists who trusted in our own self-righteousness so that we didn't seek for an alien righteousness in Christ outside of us. We were the self-righteous, immoral people. We were the greedy ones. We were the revilers. You fill in the blank. What sins were you involved in? Such were some of us prior to Christ. And then what happened, brothers and sisters? God stepped in. He washed us, and he sanctified us, and is sanctifying us. And he justified us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our great God. He's been so merciful to us, hasn't he? Boy, do you see how the daily reminder of how God has been gracious to us is the ultimate pride deflator for us? When we return to the foot of the cross, we're reminded of the grace of God that we would be in the same place were it not for the grace of God, brothers and sisters. That we would be in the same place were it not for God sending that wonderful person or individuals who shared Christ with you. You wouldn't be here on the human level if, if you had not heard that gospel message, right? And God moved in your heart so that you responded by faith. Such were some of us. And so listen, if you're so called 
righteous anger. If your so-called righteous anger doesn't drive you to your knees to plead for sinners to be reconciled to God, then it's most likely not righteous anger you're experiencing. You're just annoyed is what you are. That's it. And it goes no deeper. And if your so-called zeal for God doesn't move you in your heart to want to share Christ with the unconverted, then it's most likely not righteous zeal you're experiencing. You're simply just irritated. That's all that's happening to you right now. So if we're going to engage as bearers of reconciliation, we must cultivate that sense of responsibility, that sense of ownership, that we are under divine orders. Second, we must cultivate a Christ-like heart. That's your second sub-point. Cultivate a Christ-like heart. Because you see, it's, not, it's, not, it's just not, the only thing that's important here is not just that you engage in fulfilling your God-given responsibility, but it's equally important to do it with the right kind of heart, emulating the heart of Jesus. Look at verse 20. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, and then watch this, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How do we appeal, Paul? Pleading, begging, beseeching, persuading. That's the sense of our fervent appeal. We implore you, says Paul. Jeez, what's up with Paul? What's the matter with Paul? Why is he getting so worked up about this whole reconciliation thing? Well, I'll tell you, it's because of the, of the gravity of the situation, right? It's because of the weightiness of what's at stake here. In fact, earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, notice how he puts it. 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we, he says, are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Interpretation, Paul says, as bearers of reconciliation, we understand that when we preach Christ, we understand what's at stake. That some will believe passing from life to eternal life, and some will reject Jesus passing from death to eternal death, to eternal separation in a place called hell, a real place called hell. Paul understood what was happening in the impartation of the gospel, that from a human perspective, how someone responds to the message of Jesus, heaven and hell hang in the balance. Have you ever felt that? I have. That's what he's saying. Do you see why Paul is getting so worked up? And he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In the light of this reality, brothers and sisters, we don't come to people heralding a message of reconciliation in some heartless manner, in some robotic, impersonal, feelingless, machine-like kind of way. Oh no, we don't come this way. Rather, we come with a great sense of, of earnestness, with a great sense of urgency. It's as if this building were on fire. We wouldn't tell you in some kind of sort, sort of casual way, right? One of the pastors gets up here, excuse me, folks, you know the building is on fire? We don't mean to bother you guys, but would you pr please, pretty please, exit the premises whenever you get a chance, if you're willing. Would we do that, brethren? Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? Why? Because your life is at stake. That's why. It would be a sense of urgency, a sense of earnestness, right? Think about that all the more when it comes to gospel ministry and the ministry of reconciliation. The seriousness of the matter at hand dictates the gracious impartation of the gospel, but with a sense of earnestness and a sense of urgency. Why do we come this way? We come this way because we recognize that we live in a society where there are many amongst us who are the living, walking, driving dead. I felt that coming here to church earlier. Come to a red light next to me, to my right, to my left, in front of me, behind me. If those people who are driving those cars are not in Christ, they might physically be alive, but do you understand that they are spiritually dead? 
Those people that you pass by every day on your way to work, if they're not in Christ and they're walking and jogging or doing whatever, or they're at parks and all of that, they might be physically alive, but they are spiritually dead apart from Jesus. What does that do for you? How does that motivate you to want to share Christ all the more? You see, that's why we come with a sense of urgency and earnestness, because there are the walking dead amongst us. And we come with a sense of earnestness because heaven and hell hang in the balance. People's souls, brothers and sisters, are at stake in our county, in our state, in our country, all over the world. And yes, it's not our job to save them, but we are to be faithful to the gospel message and leave the results in God's hands. Amen? That's why we're here, to preach Christ, to share Christ. People's souls are at stake. Well, I don't know about that, preacher. Listen to me. You better believe it. Because the Bible tells us so that from a human perspective, how you even tonight uh, respond to the saving message of the gospel determines where you will spend eternity. Believe it. You must know today that your soul is at stake if you haven't trusted Christ. Jesus said, what will it profit a man or a woman if he or she gains the whole world and forfeits his or her soul? And what will a man or woman give in exchange for his or her soul? Answer, nothing. If you could, if you could achieve those things, if you're not in Christ here tonight, if you could achieve those things that you long for, that you wish for, that you want so desperately, if, granted, we can give you all of those things. What Jesus says in Mark chapter 8 is that none of those things can ever gain you favor before God. You can achieve all of those things, whatever those things are, and then forfeit your soul. Listen. Listen. So I plead with you. I beg you. I beseech you. Be reconciled to God tonight. Tomorrow may not, be, may not come. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you can be forgiven, when you can be reconciled by turning from, your, from, your, from yourself, repentance, and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Be reconciled to God. And for us who are Christians, we need to engage with the right kind of heart, right? With a heart of compassion like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, it says about Jesus that upon seeing the, the people, the multitudes who were coming after him, many for the wrong reasons, he knew their hearts. What was Jesus' response? He felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep having no shepherd. Oh, Jesus looks upon the eyes of those people, beloved, with, with tender pity and compassion. Why? Because they were spiritually dead, spiritually lost, spiritually aimless and hopeless. And brethren, if, if Jesus could look into the very hearts of people, knowing perfectly the hideousness of their dark hearts and still have compassion and tender pity for them, how much more should we, who are no better than the next sinner, right? Right? The only difference being that we're saved by grace. We should show the same compassion as well. In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, upon seeing from a distance the great city of Jerusalem, it says that Jesus mourned for her and he cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I have gathered your children together, or would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says that when Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and listen to this, he wept over it. Imagine that. Was Jesus just putting on a show? Oh, Compass Bible Church is going to read this text 2,000 years from now, and I want them to think that I had compassion, so I'm going to set the example for them. What do you guys think? No, he sincerely, genuinely had compassion for these people. That he was driven to weep for them. His heart was broken for those sinners in their dark spiritual state. He was so moved that he wept. Beloved, may I ask you tonight, what is the state of your heart toward the lost right now? Seriously. Before the Lord, 
in the quietness of your heart. When was the last time that you had a similar response to the darkness going on around you? When was the last time that your heart was stirred, that you were so moved by the terrifying wickedness in our city and in our state and in our country and in our world even? When was the last time that you were driven to tears even, to weeping for what we see around us? When was the last time that you were driven to fervent prayer for those people, right? They're not those people. They're image bearers just like you. Walking in spiritual darkness. But when was the last time you were driven to prayer to beseech the Lord of the harvest for more laborers, more gospel preachers? Oh, brothers and sisters, if we're going to be truly Christ-like, then we need to cultivate that kind of Christ-like compassion over the brokenness of our world. And this will drive us to action as we engage as bearers of reconciliation. Thirdly, thirdly, we should be able to expound on the basis of reconciliation. Not only must you exult in your reconciliation and engage as a messenger of it, to want to see other sinners come to faith in Jesus Christ, but you need to be able to expound on the glorious person who's made reconciliation possible. You need to know the message. And Paul has already told us back in verse 18 that this reconciliation is through Christ, right? In verse 19, that in Christ God is reconciling the world to himself. He's told us who the basis of reconciliation is. It's Jesus. Look at verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ. At the end of verse 20, we implore you on behalf of Christ. Over and over again, we see the centrality of Jesus as the means or the basis, rather, of our reconciliation. Trusting in the person and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ is the only way someone can be saved. Look at verse 21. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible Beautiful verse, verse 21. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, this is good stuff right here, isn't it? This is the, this is the greatest offer ever given. It is known as the great exchange. But listen to me, friend. If you don't know Jesus tonight, you're not going to find a better offer than this one. Mark it. You won't find it. No religion, no philosophical system, no world ideology has this. And here's the great exchange. Ready? Our sins were placed upon Jesus. Did you hear that? Our, place, our sins were placed upon Jesus and personalized this, Christian, all your sinful thoughts, all your sinful attitudes, all your sinful priorities, all your sinful idolatries, all your sinful aspirations, all your sinful actions, all your sinful words, and on and on and on. All of your sins placed upon Jesus and he paid for them. It is finished. It is done. Sufficient sacrifice. Amen? Wow. He made him to be sin for us. And then in exchange, what did we get in return? His perfect righteousness is placed upon us. We became the righteousness of God in Christ. Glory to God. What a wondrous exchange. Amen? The righteousness of Jesus is humanity's greatest need. Why? Because we are all lawbreakers against a holy and righteous God creator. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We've all offended him. Thus we are guilty and stand condemned before him. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. There are no righteous people in this world apart from Jesus Christ, right? None are righteous. This is why we need an, an alien righteousness at Luther, a righteousness outside of ourselves. And this righteousness is made available through the one righteous one, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the basis of reconciliation. 
The righteous one who lived the perfect, sinless life that we should live but cannot. The righteous one, beloved, who died in the place of sinners to pay for sins, satisfying the fullness of the Father's wrath for our sins. The righteous one who rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, victorious over sin and death, the great tyrants. The Lord Jesus Christ is the righteous one who ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, who is returning to judge the living and the dead. And one day the great question will be, if you don't know Jesus tonight, will you stand clothed in that righteousness? That righteousness that is provided for sinners by means of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Know the message and be able to expound upon it and explain it. And do us all a favor, if you're a believer here tonight, don't drink the Kool-Aid that, that our culture is handing you right now, that there are many roads or ways to heaven. How many ways to heaven are there, beloved? One. Exclusively, Christ is the basis of our reconciliation. Jesus alone is the one mediator between God and men. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus alone is the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we are saved. And then Acts 17, 30 and 31, God is now commanding all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, who is that? Jesus, whom he has appointed. Christ is exclusively the basis of reconciliation. Never forget it. Believe it with all of your heart. Defend it. Amen? Defend it. Christ exclusively is the hope for mankind. Well, as you know, the holiday season is upon us pretty soon. How many of you are excited about that? <laughs> not, not everybody. Because <laughs> of all the craziness and the busyness that that brings, right? Well, it will be a great time. A lot of food, and I'm not looking forward to that part. Uh, yes, for the tasty foods, but no, because I'm going to have to exercise all the more, right? We're going to have great food, great festivities. To be able to spend time with family, close family, extended family. We're going to have lots of fun, even as a church family. Lots of wonderful things with the holidays. We're also going to enjoy great music during especially the Christmas season. And I, for one, can't wait to sing one of my favorite songs during Christmas time. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. How many of you like that song? Yeah. That's one of my top five Christmas songs. There's a line in that song that says this, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, and say it with me, God and sinners reconciled. What a great reminder. What a great reminder that angels, brothers and sisters, rejoice when one sinner is reconciled to God. It's a reminder that the, that the kingdom of God no matter how bleak and how dark the times may seem, the kingdom of God is advancing one repentant sinner at a time. One reconciled sinner at a time. And so knowing this, knowing this, part of the reason why I wanted us to reflect upon this passage is that we need to remember that the holiday season is going to especially provide us with many opportunities. Many, if you want to put it this way, divine appointments, by which I mean people, people that God has already put on your path, maybe in those many mission fields that you find yourself in, or people that God will put on your path, divine appointments, people with whom we need to share Christ. And my prayer, as one of your pastors here, and I know that's the prayer of all of our pastoral staff is that we would be devoted to this ministry of reconciliation, especially during the holiday season. Amen? May God help us, brothers and sisters, not to neglect this precious ministry that we've been given by God's grace. Let's pray. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the cross of Christ. Thank you for his glorious resurrection. Thank you for the fact that even though at one time we were yet sinners, we were lost, destitute, living in spiritual decadence, that you send Jesus into the world to save sinners such as us by grace. We thank you for that. But let us also remember that we are here on this earth as pilgrims, as aliens and strangers. This world is not our home. Father, remind us of that. And move in our hearts, move in our heart affections all the more to be broken for the lost around us as Jesus was. And help us to be catapulted to sharing the message of Jesus in every opportunity that we have. And help us also, Lord, not just to, to share Christ, but to do it in gentleness, to do it with compassion, to do it with a sense of tender pity, remembering that were it not for your grace, we would still be there as well. So, Father, help us not just to be about the right message, but the right motivation as well, your glory and the good of our fellow image bearers. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.